exploits black America and from rage to responsibility and the antidote healing America from the poison of hate, blame and victimhood. Reverend Peterson also founded Bond, a nationally recognized nonprofit organization dedicated to rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. You can find Jesse's work at jessieleepeterson.com and rebuildingtheman.com. Reverend Peterson, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me back. I really, really do appreciate it. So we have a little bit of work ahead of us, it would seem. I'm not sure if we're heading in the right direction these days. Sometimes it feels like there's an undertow. And I am increasingly finding it hard not to describe the struggle in anything other than spiritual terms. Uh, and yeah. I, you know, I know there's a lot of laws and there's questions about diversity and there's history and so on and there's statues being pulled down. But why I keep being drawn back to your work is because you do encapsulate the spiritual element and uh, almost the demonic element, I think, that is wending its way through society. I wonder if you could help my audience who hasn't heard us talk before understand your perspective on these matters. You're absolutely right. It is a spiritual battle. It is a warfare between good and evil, right versus wrong. You know, the scriptures tell us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and wickedness and evil in high places. And so uh, if America understood that, then the folks who are on the side of good will defeat evil, we will overcome it with good. But unfortunately, so many people are not aware of that today. The one good thing about it, oh, let me say this first. Uh, in my book, The Antidote, Healing America from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood, my recent book, I prove that racism does not exist and that it has never existed. That's why we have not been able to solve the problem because it is something that is, is an illusion. It is something that has been made up by the children of the lie. You have folks, there are some people who are on the side of good and there are some who are on the side of evil. And in all races, it's not just one particular race. And those on the side of evil uh, appears to be winning but they win by lying to us and intimidating. Racism has never existed. Even when we gave black Americans a black president, I didn't vote for him, but uh, many white folks voted for him twice because they thought that if they gave black people Barack Obama, then blacks would know that most white people are not against them. They want them to do well in society. But instead of things getting better, between the races, they got worse because Barack Obama used this idea of racism in order to further his agenda. He's a socialist, he's a liberal, he's a liar, and he used that hatred. He doesn't have respect for this country, so he used the race issue in order to nearly destroy this country. Black Americans are suffering not because of racism, because it doesn't exist, but due to the destruction of the family and the lack of moral character. Blacks are angry, and they are first being made uh, to be angry by their mothers. Most black men and women hate their mothers because their mothers tried to turn them away from the fathers, and in many cases did. She imposed her will upon the children, causing them to become angry and turn it away from their innocence. And as you know, when you resent someone, when you're angry at someone, you become like the person that you're angry at. And so blacks are angry at their mothers and they're yearning for their fathers. And instead of telling them to forgive their mothers and fathers, they're told that it's white, it's the white man. So they're transferred that anger toward white Americans in order to use them, to, to use white folks to intimidate them in order to get power and wealth. And there's a spiritual order to life, and that order is God and Christ, Christ and man, man over woman and woman over children. And that father represent Christ on earth. So when you turn the, the, the wife and children away from the fathers, evil is allowed to come in to take over, to deceive and take over. And so that's what we'll have right now. And it's so apparent, it's so wide open right now that I think we are very fortunate to see what's really going on. This question of anger is really foundational, and I think, and I, if we can delve into this a little more, I think it'd be fantastic, because anger can be a very positive 
emotion. I mean, I'm thinking of, of course, you know, the story of Jesus uh, with the money changers and so on. Anger can be a very positive and healthy emotion, but it has a great danger. You have to be very, very careful with anger. And and it sort of, it struck me looking at Charlotte recently, one of the complaints out of uh, certain black activists, which, you know, I think is very fair, is that, you know, whites uh, stole history, you know, destroyed history in the black community and slavery, erased history and so on. I'm not sure that solution is to erase history now for the South no. as a whole. I, I do not like this, this dang, like wanting to be outraged about injustice, wanting to do something about injustice is a wonderful thing. But the idea that you can become what you fight, you know, there's that old Nietzsche quote that says, be careful when you hunt monsters that you do not yourself become a monster. That's right. And That's uh, right. I wonder if you can help people. I, I can't figure out this line. It's not something that comes very easily to me between, you know, sort of righteous, healthy anger and really toxic rage. There is no such thing as, well, the anger that Christ had was a discernment without judgment. Uh, when you don't have the anger that bring on emotions and doubt and fear and worry, you have discernment. You're able to see what's wrong and then deal with it without resenting it. Because when you resent it, it is the spirit of the deceiver. Everyone, I don't care who it is, Anyone who has anger in his or her heart is of their father, the devil. And in that fallen state of anger, there is no love. You cannot love and be angry because Satan, the deceiver, has no love in him. It does awaken an emotional feeling. And a lot of people think that that is love. But love is simply not hating. When you don't have resentment, when you don't have uh, anger in your heart, you have love. You have the original nature that you were born with and born in, and that's the nature of God. And in his nature, there is no hatred. It's a solid foundation. It's able to see what is wrong and deal with it, but don't hate it. It is uh, a light unto your feet. And so a lot of people think that you could be a son or a daughter of God and still have anger. That's why God said, and it's not true, by the way, it's discernment that we have. God said that before you enter into the kingdom of heaven within, you must forgive because that nature is the nature of the prince of darkness. God's nature is love. And as kids, we had that. We were born with that. That's why our children are innocent. They see injustice. They speak up about it. They tell the truth. But because their parents are in a fallen state of anger, they can't handle that truth from the children. So they impose that nature up on the children, causing the kids to resent them. And the moment the kids start to resent them, they lose that innocence and they wake up to another reality. And that reality is the same nature that's in their parents. Um, so what I've shown people is that they must forgive so they can overcome that and return to the Father so that they can return to their original nature. We can discern injustice, but don't hate injustice, then you can overcome it. The moment you drop that anger, you now have love. And love is not a feeling, it's not something you can touch or feel, it is, it is a light unto your feet. It is the foundation that is the foundation of our Father God. And the temptation of the devilish forces, of, of the negative forces of evil in the world, the temptation seems to me, Reverend Peterson, to go something like this. I offer you an identity that distracts you from virtue. I offer you a, a, a substitute for your soul, which is a collective identity, whether it's Republican or Democrat or, or Black yes. or white or whatever. Whatever I can get you to found your identity on that is not the pursuit of virtue, I really don't care what it is, as long as you're distracted from the pursuit of virtue. Absolutely. That's why we must overcome the world. We must overcome a need for physical things and for people, because whatever you identify with, it controls you. And so when you let that anger go by forgiving your parents first, because they've done the best that they can do. You know, God said that there will come a day when I will return the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. That day is at hand. And I noticed that everyone, including myself, who have forgiven their mothers 
and forgiving their fathers for not being there because deep down in the soul of every human being, there is a yearning for the father. Now, they may think they're yearning for money or friendship or, or talent, whatever they use it for, uh, think that it is. That's not what it is. It is a return to the father. And so everyone who has forgiven and returned to the father they now are being made whole, they have perfect peace, they can see, and when they can see, they can deal with issues in the right way. You mentioned the blacks in uh, Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Those blacks have no clue as to what they want because they are blinded by their anger. And that's why they are constantly accusing white Americans. They want something. They think that there is something that white folks can give them or this country can give them that can cause them to feel better. There is nothing, no material things. They could tear down all the uh, monuments. They could tear down, you know, uh, whatever they want. They're still going to be unhappy because that anger has separated them from God. And only a forgiveness, only a admitting that you are wrong instead of someone else would change that. Uh, Black Lives Matter, for an example a far-left, liberal, radical, evil, agitated organization that's worse than the KKK. Look what they did while Obama was in the White House. They chanted, what do you want? Dead cops, when do we want it now? They chanted, pins in the blanket, fry them like bacon. They lied and said there was something called police brutality. And so they, de they are deceivers because they have a hidden agenda and that agenda is to destroy white Americans, to destroy anything that look white, act white. That's why they hate black people, those who are educated but don't have hatred in their hearts, those who speak well, do well, don't hate. They hate them too because they think that those people are acting white. Uh, Antifa, same kind of thing. So when the president said, there is anger and destruction and evil on both sides of the fence. He was right about that. He was absolutely correct. For too long, we have allowed black Americans to be very destructive. They are now uh, uh, raping, killing, robbing, and attacking white Americans. You barely hear about it because their anger and destruction is protected, but it's only making them worse. And the only way that's going to change is that we got to tell them the truth because they're just getting lies. Barack Obama invited them to the White House. Just imagine if President Trump invited the KKK or the skinheads to the White House after knowing that they have caused destruction in the past. That would not be tolerated. But because blacks are blacks and they're complaining about slavery, which has no impact on their lives at all, uh, this country is allowing them to do it. It's not good for the country and especially not good for black people. And this is a great temptation that we all have when we are dissatisfied with our lives, as, as happens to everyone from time to time. There's this great temptation that we can go out and find some external solution. We can right. lose weight, we can uh, get muscled, we can get that girl, we can get that job, we can get a raise, we can win the lottery. But if you follow the lives of this, when you were speaking, uh, Rodney King popped into my mind, you know, like he won all this money and, and, and was, was a hero to many people in the black community and ended up, what, ODing in a swimming pool and, right. and look at people like like uh, 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 O.J. Simpson or y y anybody, doesn't matter what race, they win the lottery, you know, 99 times out of 100, you check in them in five years and they say basically winning the lottery was like the worst thing that ever happened. There's no yes. external solution to the problem of a lack of meaning, of a lack of morality. Uh, I write about O.J. Simpson in my book, The Antidote. Uh, in short, O.J. Uh, lived, you know, for a while he lived in San Francisco with his father and mother. When he was five years old, his father became a homosexual and he started dressing in women's clothes. And then he left the home and he became an outright drag queen. He uh, went down into the Castro district and stayed there. He eventually uh, got AIDS, AIDS and he died of that disease. And so can you imagine the shock that that must have been for a five-year-old son to find out that his father is a drag queen? And then the father leave. And once the father leave your life, whether you're male or female, it 
changes your whole life, your mentality. It changes the way you see things, the way you feel, because your identity that you need while growing up has disappeared. And now you become angry about that. You're in the darkness. And OJ has never, as far as I know, he has never forgiven his father for Turn it, turn it on him like that. And he has never forgiven his mother who was angry about that. So he became like that. And rather than somebody telling OJ he needs to forgive, they, you know, he went out looking for love, playing football, and doing the things that he uh, did, and it ended up in destruction. And everyone, Obama the same way, no father. And so Obama has that same anger. And being the president of the United States of America could not soothe the soul. Only thing that's going to soothe the soul is forgiveness. And when you forgive, that's why God said that if, if someone offends us and we are angry at someone, go to them and apologize for being angry at them. Because as long as you're angry at them, you're going to be blinded. You're going to be controlled by that. But when you forgive others, God will forgive you because the pain of the soul is still there. Even though the physical will heal, the soul is still painful because of the resentment. It's separated from God. It is separated from the tree of life. So when you go and forgive, don't ask them to forgive you. You forgive them. And when you forgive them, God will forgive you. A lot of times when you ask people to forgive you, they won't do it because they see it as a weakness. And they want to control you. Even your parents would do it. They want to control you. So God got it set up, has it set up where when you forgive, he will forgive you and make you free. He would take the spirit of anger away from you and make and give you perfect peace. I had that before and I forgave my parents, not really understanding what's going to happen. But when I forgave my parents, God forgave me. I absolutely have perfect peace. I can see in a way I've never seen before. And now I do see clearly. But because when I had that anger, I couldn't see this. But I see clearly that it's a spiritual battle. It has nothing to do with being male or female. It has nothing to do with the color. But it has everything to do with the unforgiveness that most human beings have in their hearts today. So we must forgive if we want to be free. We got to learn to speak up but don't resent. Yeah, because there's this, there are things that you get in life that are momentarily satisfying, but end up leaving you more hollow than before. Yes. You know, a lot of people like drugs or, or alcohol or like empty sexual experiences and so on. They, they take these things and it's like the food that leaves you more hungry when you're done. And I think that to me is one of the differentiating aspects between virtue and materialism. Materialism will tickle your senses, but virtue gives you strength in the very depth of your being. And, and I think we can see this with these demands from, from these activists. It's never enough. Now it's a statue. Next, it's going to be another statue. After that, it's going to be books that have to be burned. And after that, it's going to be people who have to be burned. It's never going to be enough. And this constant need to feed this beast, I think, is one of the signs that you're really heading in the wrong direction. That's how evil is. It deceives you. Because what happens is when you fall away from the light, you with anger, with judgment, you fall into the darkness. And in the darkness, Satan starts to work on your mind. He deceives you. You hear voices. You hear yourself talking to, you, to yourself. You know, you hear other voices telling you to do things. He leads you down the wrong path. And so what I tell people when they have that conflict that comes from anger, what they need to do is go to that pain within and relax in it and take the pain, but don't have an opinion about it. Don't judge it as right or wrong, but to relax in the pain. And when you relax in it, then you are overcoming it. But if you go and take a drink or smoke marijuana or go and curse someone out, then you are feeding the pain, you're feeding that identity that's made a home in you, which seems like your identity, but it's not. It's a spirit that's made a home in you, so if, within you. So if you can relax in it, then you can overcome it. You need to face it rather than running away from it. And most people run away from it by taking medication, you know, antidepressant pills, uh, or by naming it as something like post-traumatic stress disorder. They put a name to it, and as long as they're doing that, 
they are never going to be free. But you have to repent for being wrong. And being wrong is when you're angry at yourself or others. Um, I tell people all the time that every thought that they get, those that seem good and those that seem bad are all lies. They build you up just to let you down. But if you can uh, overcome that voice, that noise that you hear all the time, and return to the quiet, still, voiceless voice of God, which is revelation, by the way, then you could, you'll be guided in the right way all the time. But you got to drop the anger so you can overcome the voices of the deceiver. And a lot of people are really locked into those voices. If they believe everything it says, even though it builds them up and let them down and tell you that you're good, then it tell you that you're bad. If you could omit that, let it pass, then you could be free. And this subjugation to a larger set of rules, for you it's religion, for me it's philosophy, this, this subjugation is something that we have this angry will within us, and I have this all the time, a very libertarian audience, and I say, you need to surrender yourself to higher rules, you need to be in the service of virtue, and it's like yes. I'm, I'm, I'm clapping leg irons on them, and their <laughs> angry will kind of rises up like some venomous snake, and it's like, hey man, don't put your rules on me, it's like, but the rules are there. The rules that's are right. there. I mean, you may not, you may want to eat cheesecake all day and you may say, well, that's my angry will and I want it. But the rules of what your body needs to eat and what's healthy for you are there whether you like it or not. And the rules yeah. about virtue and how we respond to particular mental states to some degree, to a large degree, kind of outside our control. But this that's idea right. that the devil takes you out and says, you can have the world, it's almost like, and you can invent the very physics of your being and how you react as well. That is way too much power. And I don't think it's a power we have. That's right. And I do want, speaking of power, the, the Prince of Darkness, uh, does not have power. He only deceive you. If he can deceive you, if he can put fear in you, then he will control you. For an example, um, I used to date a lot. And then, you know, like when I was dating, I was so weak at the time, I had not overcome my anger. And I had become attracted to women who were just like my mother, even though I was saying, I'm going to get away from that, right? But when you have that resentment for your mother, you are attracted to that spirit no matter where it is. And so you look for a woman that's not like her, but yet it's the woman that's just like her once you get with her. And so I was so weak, I couldn't deal with women in the right way. And so whenever they wanted something from me, they would build up my ego. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so handsome. My mother told me to date you, you know? And now my ego is feeling good. And when I'm feeling good about lies, because the ego loves lies, she can control me. If she wanted money, I would give it to her. But if I said, no, I'm not giving you money, and then she would get mad at me and she would go the other way. You are no good. I hate mm. you. My mother told me not to date you. And now I'm mad. And when I'm angry, she's controlling me. And in that anger, I have guilt. And so in order to bring peace, I would have to give her whatever she wanted so that she could be happy and then I can be happy. But if you don't have that ego, you can see what's right and do it. And you can see what's not right and not do it. And you don't have an ego feeling about it because you have not made a judgment of it. You're able to see it. Uh, I do want to mention the monuments. I am so heartbroken. I'm saddened by the fact that we allow these evildoers, the children of the lie, to destroy the statues and the monuments of this country. This is a great history that we have. When we look at those monuments, when we walk past them, it is a reminder of how great this country is and how far we have come and what this country has done to make amend for its past mistakes. It makes us appreciate and love the country even more so. And you're hearing this from a man who was born in Alabama. I was born in Alabama. I was raised and grew up under the Jim Crow laws. I had to work the plantation. My grandfather was the head of it. I had to work the fields and do all those things. But I love my country. I, I can appreciate what this country has done for me. I am an American. I'm not African-American. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. There are no African dogs beating in my chest. The American guitar is playing in my heart as black as the ace of spades, 
but 100 percent American. And I don't want them to tear down the statue. It doesn't make sense. These people are angry. They just want to cause pain. They don't want to do good. They want to do evil. And we cannot allow them to do this. It's just insane, insane, insane. They want, I think, well, t tell me what you think, but I think that they want to make everyone so ashamed of America that there's little will to resist when they want to take over. I think it's really that simple. If everywhere you look, you see nothing but, you know, racism and slavery and subjugation and <laughs> patriarchy and division and hatred and class warfare, then when they say, well, we're taking over, you're like, well, why would I want to defend this rotten heap of nastiness, I right? Know. I mean, and so if they can get you to feel shame, you know, is, is a terrible way to control people, but it's very powerful. That's yes, right. They want to embarrass this country. They want to destroy this country. They want to hurt white people because they, they, they believe that they're angry at white people. And so whenever you're angry at someone, whether they did something to you or not, you want to destroy that person. And that's what they're trying to do. They want to destroy America. They don't want this country to be the shining light on the hill for the world to see. They want to destroy it. That's why uh, we got to fight against this. We cannot say yes to this because there is no end to their destruction. Like in your personal life, if you don't overcome evil in your own life, the anger, it will destroy you. It will destroy your children. It will destroy the cat, the dog, the grass, the paint on the house. It will destroy. But if we don't stop these people with good, it's over for America. I cannot stand to see what they're doing by destroying the history of this great nation. When you have people, I think that you and I would probably strongly disagree with some of the white nationalists and so on, when you have them on your show, one thing I think is really fascinating, and it's something that I have done uh, as well, which is instead of asking people about their ideas, asking them about their history. Because very few people, I think, understand how some of their most abstract ideas come out of their earliest, most personal, and often most secret experiences, as you were talking about with, with OJ. How's that process been going, and, and what can people learn from it when they want to talk about ideas with people? What you learn is, and the reason I do it, because I want people to get to know themselves. The beginning of life, the beginning of salvation, the beginning of freedom is to know thyself. And so when I question them in that manner, I'm trying to get them to reflect on their lives so that they can understand what is causing them to do and think the way that they do and think. They don't realize what's driving them. And so far in the last 27 years, I've found that all of the people who are destructive, who identify with material things, who hate their fellow man, it starts in the home first. Mm. Every one of them start out resenting their parents at some point. And that resentment clouds their view and they wake up thinking that their problem is a physical problem. Whether it's the black man or the white man or the, or the Jewish man or whatever, they wake up to a different reality, to an illusion, thinking that um, that's what it is. I interviewed uh, Spencer. What is Spencer first name? Richard, Richard Spencer yeah. recently. And I tried to, you know, I let him say some things that he wanted to say, but I tried to get into his life. What was your relationship with your father? What was your relationship with your mother? And I noticed he did not have a good relationship with his father. And so when I talked about it, tried to get him to get into it, there was a, a little rejection to deal with that reality because the ego doesn't want to deal with the truth. And, and so Spencer is into identity politics. And I tried to warn him that identity policy doesn't work. It divides, it doesn't satisfy you, it's a wrong road to take. But because he has this thing going on with his father, and it seemed to be resentment toward his father, that he is now believing that if white people got into white people and had a white identity, that somehow or another is gonna make white people better, and it won't. He's gonna end up in the same ditch 
that blacks have ended up in, that the liberal women who have, who hate men have ended up in, the radical homosexuals, the, the Hispanics, when they identify with physical self, with physical things, they don't get better. But if they can reflect on this anger and the way they feel about their parents and then forgive their parents, then they can deal with these issues in the right way. Right. Let's talk a little bit about forgiveness because this is a challenge for people. The, the, the knowledge of what forgiveness is was used to be taught in church and obviously is still taught in church, but I guess a lot of people aren't going. <laughs> and um, right. so, so a lot of people think forgiveness means pretending something didn't happen, going on as if, as if nothing happened, or forgiveness means uh, a, a wide variety of things. What is the process? Like if you say, okay, my, my mother did something wrong, my father did something wrong, maybe something really egregious, maybe something really terrible, you know, beating or molestation or something like that. Right. What is the process that people can approach the idea of forgiveness with so that it doesn't leave them vulnerable to exploitation, so it doesn't have them in a situation where they have to pretend something didn't happen that did happen? What does it mean to forgive and how is that lived? Uh, the way that you understand forgiveness and then how to forgive, uh, once again, is to get to know yourself. And then you realize that there are things in your life that you do that you wish you didn't do. There are things that you have done to others that you wish you had not done. And you say to yourself, I would never do that again. Um, I can't believe I did it. Whatever it might be, whether it's being you know, mean to your children or to your friends or smoking pot or whatever, you think, wow, how in the world did I do that? And you start to realize there's something that's made a home in you and it causes you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And so if I'm this way, you realize if I'm this way, then the person that I'm mad at, whether it's friends or parents or white folks or black folks, you realize, well, they must not have been able to help themselves. And they wouldn't want you to hate, your parents don't want you to hate them for the mistakes they made. And so if you can understand yourself, knowing that it's not you that are doing these things, but something that is causing you to do it, it will help you to forgive others. And so once you see that, you go and forgive, and in that very moment, I'm telling you, in that very moment, that spirit is taken away from you. You return to your original state of being. And it is as though you have never gone through anything. There's no more memory of it, meaning that it doesn't play over and over in your mind. Even when you tell people about it, it almost, it's almost like you're lying about it because there's no more spiritual pain. Your soul is not feeling the pain of it anymore because it has reconnected to the tree of life and, and the tree of life is God within us. And so by forgiving, it set you free from the pain of it, from the memory of it, but it awakened you so that you could see and those things would never, ever happen to you again. If you really want to have control over your life, you must forgive because in forgiveness, you have perfect love. Perfect love makes you free. Uh, it gives you authority over the enemy. And it's not like if you want to be strong, perfect love is the way to go. Forgiveness is the way to go. Everyone who has anger are weak. They have no power. They have no authority. And they end up in the same situation one way or another over and over again. But once you forgive, you will never, ever ever end up in that situation again or any other bad situations, it would be as though it has never happened to you. You become a brand new child. You become, as the scripture call it, reborn again, and you start living from that point forward. The old has passed away. The, the future doesn't exist. All you have is right now, and you live and grow moment to moment because you start to overcome situations rather than overreacting to situations. Because every time you overreact, uh, it destroys you. You're being controlled. I want to tell you a quick story about something that happened to me last Friday, if I may. I was, I was, I've got a note here. I was going to bring this right up. So please go <laughs> yeah. ahead. Um, last Friday, I was at my gym, uh, Equinox, here in L.A. And Equinox is uh, in West L.A. It's on Sepulveda Boulevard between Olympia and Pico. And I've been going to that gym for years. I was a member when it was um, uh, um, 
it was uh, Sports Club LA, and then Equinox bought it later. And um, just, I know everybody, everybody know me. When President Trump decided that he was going to run for president, when he first announced he was going to run, and he said, I'm going to put a big, beautiful wall around the borders. I'm going to bring back jobs. I'm going to deport illegal aliens. I'm going to protect the country from radical Islamic terrorism. I'm going to cut back on restrictions. I said that day, this is our next president. And long story short, when he won, I woke up on the 9th of November, 2016. I turned on the TV because I couldn't stay awake all night, right? So I turned the TV on. I wanted to see did he win. And they said he had won. I went to cloud nine, and I have been dancing on the ceiling ever since. (laughs) (laughs) And everybody in the gym knows this. And I've been warned over the over, you know, since he's been there, that you need to be quiet about this. And a lot of folks have seen me in, on TV interviews or heard me on the radio. And but I've been warned, this is a liberal gym. You should not be openly talking about President Trump like this. And uh, and there are members of the gym and people who work there who will love the president, but they're afraid to say it. But I refuse to have that fear. These people talk about the president and the neck in the way at the gym. They talk about Hillary Clinton, how they support him. I have the same freedom, and I won't give it to the enemy. So last Friday, I was uh, doing a radio interview at 10 a.m. Uh, uh, my friend Bill Cunningham out of Cincinnati, Ohio, was uh, interviewing me about the president, all this stuff that's happening now. And so I've been doing these interviews all the time at the gym because what I do, I rush to the gym, put on my workout clothes, then I find a quiet room or a quiet spot. So I'm in this, uh, what seemed to be a um, janitor closet or something like that. And I'm doing this interview and a worker came over and he said, you can't be here. You got to get out of here now. And I'm like, hold on, man, just 10 minutes. Nobody has ever given me problems before. I'm like, hold on a minute. He's like, no, 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 you can't be here. So he went and got a manager and the manager came back and he got in my face. You got to get out of here now. You got to leave this building. You cannot come back anymore. We are going to cancel your membership. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? This is like kind of radical about me standing here doing a quick interview. So I, I walked out of the area and I lost the call. So I lost the interview. And the guy was like, in my face. So I used my man words and I said, get the F out of my face, man. And then he got really mad. He said, you can't talk to the employees that way. And I said, oh yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have used that. So I reached my hand out to apologize. I said, I'm sorry, but they wouldn't accept my apology. And so the manager, his name is Scott, he told the worker to go and call the police to throw me out. And when, when the worker left, he said, I heard, no, he said, you said that there's no such thing as racism and that uh, between against blacks and Hispanics, and you are a Trump supporter. And I said, oh, that's what this is all about. Because it was so extreme, so shocking, that I didn't understand why they were acting out that way. And he said, you're a Trump supporter. And I said, oh my God, that's what this is all about. And the guy was so angry that he threw me out of my gym. And, and it was just amazing to experience that. You know, I was bullied, I was attacked, I was harassed because I support President Trump. And that happened last Friday. I'm very sorry uh, for, for that experience. And uh it is terrible because it's not an argument. You know, throwing you out of your gym is not a way of proving you wrong. It's not a way of, of having a discussion. They should uh, sit down with you and have a conversation, you know, well, as, right. as I think every reasonable idea would suggest. I've donated to this gym. You know, every year at the end of the year, they have like a little fundraiser thing going where they, they ask us to donate shoes for the homeless. And so I've donated bucket loads of shoes, truck loads of shoes. My organization, Barn, collects the shoes and donated to the gym. I have a good relationship with most of the people around there. They know where I'm coming from. And when we do have discussions, discussions about politics, it's not personal. But since President Trump been there, these people are like hating the president. They like hate him to a passion and they hate anyone who support him. And that's why my gym over at Equinox threw me out. So right now I'm looking at my options to see what to do about it. Just kind of taking my time. I call the manager at the gym, Jeff, uh, what's Jeff's last name? 
Jeff Peters over at the gym. I've not heard back from him. I've contacted the headquarters in uh, New York and, and the corporate office. Have not heard anything about uh, back from any of them yet. And it's been a week. It's a week from today. It was a week ago today. So I'm waiting to see, just kind of taking one step at a time to see the right thing to do. Right. No, it's terrible. I mean, this is not at all a comparable experience, but I was uh, uh, on, on Twitter a couple of days ago. I was uh, tweeting just about how, okay, they've, they've torn down all these statues, but the illegitimacy rate in the inner cities is still approaching 80%. And removing That's a right. statue a couple of thousand miles away isn't going to change that. It's not like they're going to wake up in a, in a ghetto, in a black community tomorrow. They're going to wake up and say, well, that statue 3,000 <laughs> miles away is gone. You still don't have a daddy. You still don't have job skills. You still don't That's have right. a hardworking environment that you grew up in. You still don't have access to good advice on how to get and keep a job. The statue's gone. What has changed for you? 100% agree. They're still going to have the black on black violence in Chicago, which is out of control, just so mm. amazing. And Chicago mayor decided that he's going to have a sanctuary city, which means that all of the, the illegal aliens, the criminal ones, and whomever are going to be there, and the situation is going to get worse. It's not going to change that. It's not going to change the low uh, unemployment, I mean, the high unemployment rate in the black community. It's not going to bring black men and black women back together, as you said. It's not going to change anything. That's why we got to tell the truth and stop these people from destroying our country. We have given black Americans affirmative action. They literally get into universities and businesses or jobs because they're black, not because they're earning it. We have allowed them to live wherever they want to live. Uh, we, I mean, just everything, we gave them a black president. And yet, and, and white people don't speak up to them. So they get it, they've gotten everything they want and instead of getting better, they have only gotten worse. And the only way they're going to get better is by telling them the truth. And when they commit crime, put them in jail. And if my grandfather would say, leave them there. <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've got to do it because they don't have a conscience. They don't have a, uh, they're not self-controlled. They don't have a consciousness. So they need the law in order to contain them. But when you take the law away, to, uh, they have nothing you to control them because the lawless need the law of the land. When you remove that, it's over. And that's what they have done for black Americans. Look what happened in uh, Missouri, uh, Ferguson. I mean, they took the law away, and cops backed down, and they went out of control. It is so bad there now that they call for a ceasefire. How are you going to call for a ceasefire with criminals? And so we got to bring the physical law in and control these people because they don't have the law, the laws of the heart to guide them. It's bad. And it's going to get worse if we don't stop what we are doing. And let's talk about the family, because this is something that you focus on, I focus on. Uh, to me, just so much of what pe who people think they are begins with the family. And there is, of course, this, you know, collapse of the black family, collapse of the yes. Hispanic family, increasingly now, uh, collapse of the white family. Soon the East Asians, I'm sure, will fall like a house of cards as well. That's right. And people don't understand just how strong the black family used to be. Uh, in the 20s, in the 1930s, 1920s, black family was stronger than the white family. I mean, the, the black family survived slavery. You got slaves walking across three different states to rejoin their family. This level of devotion of, of black men to, to the family I think was one of the things that helped get so many uh, blacks out of the poverty, into the middle class, into successes. People think now it's all just racism, but are people going to argue that, that if the racism was not there in the 1920s? Of course it was, but the family was strong. <laughs> that's right. And you mentioned that it's happening to the white family. It absolutely is. And that's why the white man is under attack. The, the left, the children of the lie, hate the white man more than they hate sin itself. Uh, that's why they hate the president. They hate any white man who is a straight male a Christian uh, 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 with power, with wealth. They hate that because it's, in all honesty, it's the straight, white, Christian, conservative man of power that is really holding the country together as much as it is today. And that's why they want to get rid of him. Because if they can destroy the white, white conservative, Christian male, 
it's over for the country. That's why they hate President Trump. He is a straight, white, conservative, Christian male of power, and he's holding the country together. When they get rid of him, it's over. Uh, they did that with the black man. I, I mentioned that I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama. I am 68 years old right now, so I grew up under the Jim Crow laws. And the thing that we had going for us, we had a father and a mother. We had grandparents, grandfather, grandmother. We, uh, there were less than 10% of black children born out of wedlock. If a child, if a woman got pregnant out of wedlock in those days, it was an embarrassment. She would either have to have a shotgun wedding or go in hiding. One of my worst fears when I started dating in high school was to get a woman pregnant because I knew that I would have to marry her. And so that's because we had high standards. Abortion was not heard of. It was not even known. I had not even heard the word abortion growing up because even if they had a Down syndrome baby, the mother, the woman would have that baby. The father and mother would take care of that baby if the baby lived they took care of it. If it expired, then they understood that. They did not abort the baby. Uh, we were taught to work. I don't ever remember not working, even if it was things I had to do around the house. When I would get out of school in the evening, I would uh, rush home, take off my school clothes, put on my work clothes, and go work. I'm in the fields or whatever I had to do, chopping down trees for firewood. It was just natural and normal. I have an aunt. Uh, who got married, she and her husband bought land, and they had about 15 kids or so, maybe more. <laughs> and their kids did not have to work the plantation. They didn't have to work the cotton fields because they had land and they did their thing. Each and every one of their children finished high school, went to college. Each and every one graduated from college and, uh, college, and, uh, college, and now they're doing well in this society. In spite of Jim Crow law, we had strong family values. We respected the elder, elderly. I don't know one gang fights between black and black was unheard of. I didn't know that even existed. It was not around at all. I, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a fight once in high school, about the 10th grade or so. Um, it was recess time, so we were up out on the field, baseball field, and it was my time to bat this other guy thought it was his time to bat and we had a fight over the bat. All right. <laughs> and, um, so the principal gave us a whooping about it because in those days you could paddle kids. And by the time I got home, my grandmother had heard about it. And to this day, I don't know how she heard about it because we had no telephones on the plantation, but she knew about it. And then she punished me for having to fight. And it was that kind of respect that black Americans had. I remember that black Americans were respected for their uh, uh, moral standards, for their respect for themselves and others. Martin Luther King even said during those days, overcome evil with good. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. That was his motto when the civil rights movement first started. It's gone now, but that's what it was. Black Americans used to be respected because they were a noble people. At one point, man, I thought that only white people sinned when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the reason I thought that, because during the summer, my uncles would go up to New York and Florida to pick oranges so they could have some extra work to do. And they would come back and they would tell us about white homosexuals and stuff that they were running into that was abnormal on the plantation. And so it made me think as a kid that only white, uh, white people sin. I know better now, but that's the type of um, morals or, or nobility that blacks had at one time. It's gone now. It no longer exists for the most part. Most not all, not all, not all, not all, but most blacks are immoral. They have turned away from God, even though they go to church, they read the Bible, they speak about God, but they don't know him. They know about him. They do not have a relationship with him. That's why they are suffering. Well, I think one of the big things that happened, and, and this is, again, what's taking down the white community as well, is children are reliability. And when you have a liability, you need someone who's going to 
bring in some income. And so if yeah. you're a woman, you want to have kids, then you need a husband. And because you need a husband who's going to bring income, you need a responsible, hardworking, dedicated, reasonable guy. Uh, whereas when you can marry the state and you get all of your money from the state, when children turn from a liability to an asset, the man becomes extraneous to the equation. He's not needed anymore. And then you can just indulge your lust, which whatever thug is, is around or whatever. And so I think men have felt... Uh, in poorer communities, regardless of race, men have felt increasingly unneeded, unnecessary. Yes. And, you know, you and I both know men work to get resources to date women. And if women can get resources without men, male ambition collapses, female responsibility collapses, male responsibility collapses, and you end yeah. up with these hellscapes in the inner cities and increasingly all over America and the West now. 100%. Um, at Barn, we were teaching young men that. We showed them how to forgive. Once they forgive the parents for failing them, they feel 100% better. We help find jobs. We uh, we start a Barn um, uh, Entrepreneur Academy. Well, I brought in I brought in businessmen, some who have retired and some who are still in business. And we have these classes and we explain everything that these boys need to know about business. I even started a credit union where we loan them the money and then they pay it back with interest. Because once they let that anger go, they feel 100 percent better. They see that white people are not their enemies and they see that they should treat people the way that they would like to be treated. We encourage them to date, but don't be having sex and doing all that kind of stuff until marriage. And now they're starting to develop good relationships. They, are, they have, I have had guys tell me, thank you so much for helping me to overcome my anger. I see now that white folks are not my problem. My problem start started in my home. They start to see that. And that's what we're doing at Barn. And I'm proud to say, to tell you, as you already know, we've been around 27 years and um, we have not received one dime from the government because I believe and we have taught that the less government in your life, the better off you are. And because I grew up that way, we didn't have government. We didn't have all that stuff. We worked hard. We helped those who, if they ran into a bad situation, we would help them out. But we don't keep the help there. They have to get back on their own feet because we wanted them to maintain their independence independency. So we did it that way. And it's those values that fathers and mothers are supposed to teach their children and the kids grow up that way. But when you don't work as a child, you don't develop that nature on the inside of you so that when you leave home, you know how to, whether you're male or female, you know how to go out into the world and become independent. There are so many men who are, men who are still living at home with their mothers. I'm counseling with a man right now uh, who happened to be black. He is 59 years old. And I told him when he was 20, in his 20s, you better move out of that house with your mother. If you don't, you would never move. It's going to destroy you. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. And now he regret not moving. He hates his mother. He is stuck with her. She make him feel guilty and he cannot even leave 59 years of age. And you have men who are living with their mothers past 18. When I was growing up, my grandmother used to tell me all the time, I'm going to show you how to work. I'm going to do my best for you. But when you're 18 years old, you are leaving here. You're <laughs> out of here. <laughs> and I'm like, well, where am I going? <laughs> you know, here I am on a plantation. I'm like, where am I going? She said, I don't care. I don't know. And I don't care. You leave it here. And at, when at I dawn turn, on your 18th birthday, I'm calling the locksmith. He's <laughs> going to come on over. He's changing those locks and you got to find right. some other place to sleep. And when I turned 18 years old, I finished high school. I left home. It was already in my mind that I had to leave. I went up to Indiana. I got me a job for two weeks because I hated Indiana. It was too cold. And I got me a job at English Steel Mill. And I hated working. I would rather work in a cotton field than to work <laughs> at a steel mill. <laughs> oh, yeah. I made one paycheck, man. And the moment I got that check, I quit that job. I flew out to L.A. and I've been on my own ever since. 
there's nothing like, you know, as sometimes the work that you and I do, you know, you get a lot of friction, you get a lot of hate, you get a lot of negativity. Yeah. But I'll tell you, man, I think like you, when you've spent a number of years working hard with your hands, this job is never going to seem that tough. Like, it's That's just, right. hey, look, I've got air conditioning. Hey, look, I'm not swatting bugs all day. Hey, look, I'm That's not right. about to fall into a vat of lava. You know, it's a much better <laughs> life, even though it can be mo emotionally challenging. So yeah. let's finish up on something that I read recently, not, not from you. But I think it's really relevant to what's going on right now, because there is, I think, a, a, a real escalation in racial tensions coming out of Charlotte and coming out of the Trump candidacy and so on. I read something recently. I want to get your thoughts on it. Anti-white racism is something that is really beginning to rise up in people's minds, in, in white people's minds. And I was reading a study it's a couple of years old. 11% of white people think that white racism is on a scale of 1 to 10 at 10. You know, and they're thinking, you know, these are the guys who excluded from jobs, excluded from universities, they can't get ahead, they can't get loans, everything seems to be going to minorities, to whites, to immigrants, to you name it. Yeah. And I have a real concern that, you know, that we were heading to this idea where we speak to each other as minds, not as skin colors, where we yeah. try and, you know, work, work together in, in ethics and freedom and peace and prosperity. This identity politics, which is built up on the left so hard, I think is beginning to spill over now. And I am sort of concerned about these escalating tensions. I think that from what I've seen, you know, the more extreme elements within the white community, they feel a very strong sense of victimhood. With that comes anger, with that comes resolution. And I'm really concerned that these two ways are going to crash together and swamp the country. Um, so what is it that you would say uh, to, to the whites who feel aggrieved at the way the country has been going lately? You're 100% correct. I write a, I write a weekly column for WarNet Daily, WarNetDaily.com, WND.com. And my column this week is Charlottesville, I tried to warn you. Hmm. Uh, I've been telling white people for the last 27 years that you better start speaking up. You got to speak up because if you don't speak up, eventually you're going to become angry. And then when you become angry, you're going to come out fighting in the wrong way. And then they're going to accuse you. They're going to pass laws. They're going to say, look, I told you the white man is racist. They're going to blame you even more so. And I've been warning over and over and over and over again. Black people are not suffering because of racism. That doesn't exist. You have nothing to do with the destruction of black Americans. So speak up and tell the truth. But they were afraid of being called racist. So they did not speak up. So now the parents of those kids did not speak up. And now the young white boys and girls are being accused of something they had nothing to do with. The unfortunate thing is that they are becoming angry about it. And because they are becoming angry, they are starting to fight this situation in the wrong way, not realizing that this is going to be used against them as well. It's and a we trap. Started, yeah. Yes. We saw an example of it in uh, Charlotte, Charlottesville, Virginia. The only thing that the media focused on was so-called white racism. The white folks did this. The KKK came and the skinheads came. And so you had all these groups who came together and some of them are angry and they acted out and now that's being used against them. So when the president said, look, anger is on both sides. These people, you might not agree with why they were there, but they had a permit, they had the right to be there. They got mad at the president because evil on the left is not accustomed to uh, being accused or being pointed out. Mm. And so I'm telling white Americans, you better not, I, I highly recommend you not go out there in anger. Fight, but not with anger. Speak up, start to defend yourself, then this thing will get better. But if they fight with anger, and a lot of white folks are becoming angry, especially young whites, it's going to be bad for the country. I, I predict that it will either be a race war or something. Something bad will happen if white folks start to fight in anger. I understand why they're mad, but it's not right to get angry because angry, it, it, it backfires on you. It's best to stand up and fight without that anger. But I do see that happening. I absolutely agree with you. And whatever the solution is going to be, it has to be centered around freedom. Look at yes. slavery, government program, Jim Crow, government program, segregation, government program, affirmative action, government program, immigration, welfare, big giant government programs. And yet we have 
developed such a mindset that now it's like, oh, we have a problem. Let's run to the government to solve it. And it's like, but these problems are in a large part, if not almost exclusively created by state power, by vote uh -huh. buying, by corruption. And the, we need to disentangle, I think, the state from its interference in race relations so that we can speak to each other without this satanic temptation of power that the government is constantly dangling in front of us. You can get the job over the white man or you can get the job over this. And it just makes everyone so uh, angry and so tense. And so the more we can do to speak freely with each other without uh, wanting to grab the gun of the state and use it to, to club the right. other person into submission, I think that's the only place that reasonable solutions are going to come from. I totally agree. That's why I've been trying to get white Americans to speak up, tell the truth, speak up, tell the truth. And then they can overcome that evil. But they have shut down and they have heard the lies and they have been accused. And as I write in the book, The Antidote, all angry people feel like victims and they blame someone else for the way that they feel. And so now you have these young white kids who are, have been attacked at universities around the country. They are not allowed to disagree with Barack Obama. They're not even allowed to say, I'm not your problem. I don't have anything to do with what you're going through. And so that anger is starting to build up and they're coming out fighting. It's just so unfortunate, but it is really happening. And the government will never help you. The government will enslave you. As a matter of fact, they create these problems. They know that it's unfair to take from the hardworking people, whether they're white or whatever, and give to those whining, whining begging people who are having babies out of wedlock, who on drugs and don't want to work. But they do it to cause the confusion between the races. And then once it starts, they pass laws that restrict you. They take away your freedom of speech. They take away your freedom to assembly, to assemble. They destroy you. And that's what's happening. And if uh, these white people, the alt-right and others go down this pathway with that kind of anger, it's not going to turn out well for them. No, and we have to be, you know, um, uh, the elder generation didn't speak up when they could, and therefore right. it's falling to the younger generation who are immature. And, you know, no, so was I yes. at that age. You know, the male brain doesn't mature until it's in its mid-20s. And we've got teenagers out there who lack impulse control, who, who lack long-term vision, who lack self-restraint. And it's, it's, a sh it's such a shame when these kinds of necessary changes fall upon the scrawny shoulders of the young and intellectually and emotionally immature as a result of the fact that their elders who had power, who had maturity, who had opportunity, didn't speak out when the time was right. That's right, because had they seen their fathers and mothers speaking up and not being afraid, that would have been passed down to them, and it would continue that way, and things will get better. And then we have to add that uh, these white kids uh, going to these liberal universities around the country, you know, even in high school, they have been lied to about the country. They have been lied to about this so-called racism. They have been lied to about white people. And so not only are they brainwashed in one by the uh, government, but they also brainwash in the education system. I'm looking at Antifa. Some of them are white, and most of them are white, and they are fighting against their own good because those same Hispanics and blacks, like Black Lives Matter and others who are fighting with them, the moment that white Antifa disagree with them, those black folks are going to turn on them as well. If they disagree with Barack Obama, or if they disagree with uh, welfare, or if they disagree that racism exists, or they say that we didn't have anything to do with your problem, immediately they would turn on them because that's what anger does. It turn on, if you can't destroy the one you hate, you're going to destroy the one that's closest to you. It doesn't love anybody. So it's so unfortunate, and I'm hoping that somehow or another you and I can convince these or young white kids, yes, speak up, but don't be angry. Don't rely on the government because it's not a good outcome. Oh, i got, got to give you an amen for that. All right. So I just wanted to remind people, go to jesseleepeterson.com, also rebuildingtheman.com. Uh, the books, um, uh, The Antidote, Healing America from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood, as well as Scam, How the Black Leadership Exploits Black America. You can check out, well, we'll, we'll I won't go through everything. We'll put out the links of all of your fine work online. Yeah. Uh, Reverend thank Peterson, you. thank you so much for your time today. Always a great pleasure. I think it's been about a year since we did an interview together. I yeah. love talking to you. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's yeah. not leave it a year again. <laughs>